Jesus, sweet Jesus, how wonderful you are, you are brighter than the morning star, you are fairer, much fairer than the lily that grows by the way you are precious more precious than gold precious you are precious more precious than gold you are precious you are precious, more precious than gold. You are precious, more precious than gold. said in Jesus mighty name we pray Amen. hallelujah all right um, I want to try and see if I can lay some some blocks upon some of the things that we've said already every time that you begin to make progress in life in the spirit, one of the things you would notice is there are different demands of God at different levels of that journey, of that progress. It's the principle uh, over and over again, and it's God's established methodology of operation that the process by which he takes you through in order to bring you to destinations that are promised, destinations that um, are guaranteed, those processes are usually as important as the destination and sometimes more important. Partly because the process is the way that God makes you one with the outcome, with the destination. You see, there's nothing God wants to give you that God cannot give you like that, a snap of a finger. God can. There's absolutely nothing God wants to give to you in terms of ability that God cannot. 
it's possible for God to do that. You know, um, um, earlier this evening I was saying something online that as Christians we need to understand distinctions and the nuances of language and the way that we use language. There are things that are possible but are not feasible even with God. There are things that are possible with God that may not be feasible for God. Uh, invoking almightiness does not mean irrationality. God does not do things irrationally because he's God. I know a lot of people think that it is a way of extolling God when we arrogate irrationality to God, but it is not. We demean God when we do that. Uh, it was Galileo, I think, that said, uh, paraphrasing him, that the God who gave us a mind did not intend that we should forego the use of it. And the word that we call logos, uh, I think uh, Reverend Israel was talking about logos and Rema the other day. Logos is the root word for the word logic. So Jesus actually is the logic of God. Um, God is not anti-process. God is not anti-logic. God is not anti-reasoning. All right? Um, Paul did a lot of that. In Isaiah, you know the passage, when God says to come together, to come, let us reason together. It was court language that was being used in that passage. Is a kind of thing that lawyers do, or uh, uh, yeah, lawyers, the kind of thing that they would do in a court of law when they stand as attorneys. That's what God was calling the leaders of Israel to come. When he says, come, let us reason together. The processes by which God brings you into some of the things that God has promised you, those processes many times are as important as the thing that God has promised you. Sometimes they are even more important. There were times when God took you through a process that you thought was going to culminate in a product, if I may use that language, or a destination. You went through the process and it was like you did not get the thing at the end of the process. And you may have felt cheated or jilted by God, um, but if God actually brought you through that process, you had no losses, believe me. What God does in the course of process is that when you go through process, there is a change that happens to you in the course of the process. That change makes you into the kind of person that would be appropriate to manage the thing that is promised in the end so that there is a becoming that takes place in the course of getting to the thing that was promised. And this is why sometimes you'd realize that when God takes people through process and brings them to a place of maybe affluence, particularly spiritual affluence, all right? Uh, people look at you and they would fantasize what they would do if they had as much anointing as a thing that you have. They are only fantasizing that way because they do not yet have it, all right? What happens is that in the course of having it, you will become someone that becomes consistent with God's idea of the kind of person that must wield that genre of grace so that you are changed in the process of getting to become the custodian of that thing. And when you now become a custodian of it, you have become a very different person altogether. Several of your ambitions and your fantasies and the idiosyncrasies in your head and all of the things that you were thinking you would do if God were to give you half of that thing. By the time God gave you double of it, you have also been doubly changed as a person so that your orientation has changed. You are, you are just not the person you used to be when you didn't have that power. In God's curious way of operating, he makes sure that those two things never meet. Your days of wild fantasies, they never meet with your days of outrageous uh, spiritual endowments. 
if God, that's if God loves you. Because God will denature you through the process of getting you to the place of that inheritance. When you get there, you are not just quite the same person who started out anymore. So people would now look at you and they will start to have the same kinds of fantasies that you used to have when you were the one looking at people that are where you are at at the moment. And you can look back on the basis of your experience and you will smile. Like, I know what you are thinking, but you see, by the time you get here, you will no longer be that person anymore. All right, I'm simply saying, you see, for instance, you might feel, hmm, there is, a, look at Jesus, for instance. Jesus goes to the cross, and before he goes to the cross, he goes, he goes through so much at the hands of the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priest, the high priest, and everything that he suffered at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Pilate, Herod, everything. Eventually, he's sentenced to death, the most shameful kind of death that a person could die, literally, uh, in the world of that time. Jesus wasn't crucified with any piece of clothing on him. So the, the, the most heart-wrenching dramatization that you have seen does not quite capture everything that happened. That's what I'm trying to say to you. It was much worse. Whatever it, whatever, whether it was the passion of the Christ, whichever one you think is the most heart-wrenching, it was much worse than that. He goes through all of that and is crucified, he's buried. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. And, you know, even from here, I've always baffled. It has always baffled me. Like, and I've said, like, you know, if I was Jesus... There's no harm in paying Pilate a visit. And Herod. And Annas. And Caiaphas. And there will be very good justification to do that. You know, when Jesus was raised from the dead, the, 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 the chief priests and the leaders, they called the soldiers and bribed them. They gave them money and said, when you go to the city, do say that his, his disciples came and stole his body while we slept. That was the source of that rumor that spread in the city. That was a very convenient excuse for Jesus to have made public appearances of himself to some of the notable brains that were behind his execution. And you know what that would have looked like. You can choose the time, choose the location. The, the moment Jesus is raised from the dead, as you remember, he, 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 even his apostles didn't know where he lived anymore. They would be behind closed doors for fear of the Jews, and then he shows up in their midst. He does his thing, and then he vanishes just as he came. There's no reason not to touch down in the temple. You know, one of the, just, just let people, just make the point that you guys thought you had me. All right? <laughs> you didn't have me. Show up to Pilate. Tap him 1 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, guy, you know, you should have listened to your wife. Remember Pilate's wife? Was the one that said, don't do that man anything. I suffered so much on account of this man in a dream of the night. Don't do him anything. You know, Jesus did not. Jesus showed himself only to his chosen apostles and disciples. Like, there is a rumor in town that your body was stolen. Make a point. You can. By the time you go through death, burial, and resurrection, there is a level of vendetta that died in the process. It's easy for us to fantasize like this because we've not been through it. When you go through it, that process will make you a person after its own image. And this is part of the reason why it looks as if God takes us through stuff in order to give us stuff. It's not because he has to. The point is not, it's not the hassle that is God's objective. God's objective is the person that you become through the process. So that sometimes, 
even if you don't get what you thought was at the end of that process, you are still going to be the better for it because you would have become something, someone incredibly different for good than the person you were before you went through that process. And so, when God starts to call us to shine and to shine with intensity, I said all of that to say to you that it calls us into a process because Gentiles will come to your light. Kings will come to the intensity, to the brilliance, to the brightness of your rising. And the brightness of your rising is something to be said for the brilliance of your rising, the intensity of your rising, that God actually intends that you will experience upgrades and upgrades and upgrades and upgrades and upgrades that your life gets to a point where your rising now can be noticed by kings and be attractive to kings. Are you with me tonight? In Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, make a quick point. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, from verse 1, the, you could project it for me if you find it. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex, to vex certain of the church. Who were the people the king stretched forth his hand to vex? Read it out for me. How many? Certain of the church. He didn't stretch forth his hand to vex the church. He stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. There's a demography in the church. And there was a demography in that church that is called certain. There were certain of the church that Herod's hand was stretched forth to vex. The man's hand was not looking to vex everybody in the church. There was, there was, there, there was a, 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 a specific group, a specific genre of people in the church that the Bible now identifies as certain of the church. These were the ones that Herod's hand was stretched out to vex. And when Herod begins now to choose the cohort that would belong in this unique group that is called certain of the church, what did he do first? The next verse, the Bible says, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So we start to see the identity of certain of the church. This is James. James, the apostle. Let's go on, verse 3. And because he saw, he saw that it pleased the Jews he proceeded further to take what? Peter also. Now you start to see a pattern emerging here. This attack seemed to be localized and focused upon the apostles. The apostles were the certain of the church. So he picks James. Now he picks Peter. The man is not looking for everybody. He's looking for certain of the church. And the certain of the church, if you do, the, if you do any hierarchical stuff, the certain of the church in context, we're at the top of that hierarchy. Because whether you like it or not, there's a certain hierarchy that exists. Either for ecclesiastical purposes or even spiritually, there's a hierarchy that exists. Is that okay? With regards to salvifically, we all stand on equal grounds. That's given. All right? But that's where it ends. The other things that are the result of 
uh, the election of grace, some other things are the result of the application of people to the processes ordained for them by God. And don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. So there is categorization that takes place in the process of time. In the realm of the spirit. That is a fact. The only thing that people miss is how to identify God's keda. Because many times the metrics that we use are wrong. But the reality is a fact. It is a reality. Okay. I'm saying that categories exist in the spirit. But you may not be accurate in your understanding of who belongs where. Because the metrics that you use to apportion people in different categories usually will not be the same as what God uses. Because most times we use increase as our metric. God doesn't use increase. Because like Reverend Austin was saying, Apollos plant, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Your, your life cannot be measured by what God gave. It's God that gave it. We are the ones who use increase to measure people. But that's not the people's, that's not their impute. It's God's impute. You cannot use what God gave to determine the person, the person's level. What you brought was either planting or watering. What God brought was increase. You cannot use the portion that only God himself could have brought as the measure of the individual's investment in the process. So Jesus said to his disciples at some point, he said, I'm sending you to go and reap where you bestowed no labor. Other people labor there, now you enter into their harvest. If you are using the metrics of men, what do you think we would have been thinking? We would be thinking that the guys going to harvest are the big guys. Because they are the ones that can post the numbers. But the back end, Jesus said, you bestowed no labor there. Other people labored. So you will be shocked, therefore, to realize that the people who did the labor were actually the giants from God's standpoint, even though they have no credence in our own side. Many of them we don't even know. I can't remember who, I, okay, I was telling uh, somebody a few days ago. I, I went to preach in a church. We've been laboring somehow in that place for about 14 years. And about two years ago or so, last year, God gave a break, finally, and the Holy Spirit broke out in the place, a very conservative uh, kind of church. The Holy Spirit broke out, and people were speaking in tongues publicly for the first time in the life of the church, publicly on a Sunday service. At the end of that service, at the end of that service, as beautiful as it was what God had done, God did something that really, really humbled me. There was an old woman that met me and was so grateful and she greeted and she, you know she was just so excited you could tell the excitement on her face and she said to me that she is so happy because she wasn't sure she would live to see this day anymore that she has been praying for this day for 27 years that she's been praying for 27 years for this day in this church and that he can, she cannot tell me how grateful she is that this day broke in her lifetime. Now, nobody may have known that that woman was laboring in intercession for an outbreak of God's spirit in the church and that she had done that for more than two decades. If you're in service that day, you might be tempted to look towards the preacher like, man, do you see what God did when that guy came? That would be your metric. But God knows who bestowed labor. Are you with me? God knows the woman that was grinding it for 27 years. That woman was not even a deaconess in the church. No leadership role, 
She had never handled the microphone in church. But she had been generating something for 27 years that God could ride upon. That's the one we know. You don't know who else is there. So God comes to Moses, for instance, and says, I've had a cry of my people in Egypt, and I am now come to deliver them. Moses was not part of the intercessors. That was what God was saying. Like, the cry I heard, I heard it in Egypt. But Moses is the big man of God, isn't it? Yes. His big manism was sponsored by people in Egypt. The people who sponsored Moses' encounter, they were in Egypt. But he became the great man of God. God went to another country and gave a man an encounter on the basis of intercession that was generated from a different country altogether. So he was taking care of the flock of his father, the Midianite. And then God met him and said, I'm, so when God said, I've heard the cry and I'm now come down to deliver them. I can imagine Moses saying, okay, if you have come down to deliver them, go to Egypt. Why are you here? And God now said, therefore come now and I will send you. That was the coming to a head of the supplication and intercession of people in Egypt. That was the reason why a bush was burning in the, in the wilderness. It was because people in Goshen prayed in a faraway country. And so it, it teaches you to maintain a certain level of humility in the presence and under the hand of God. That is to say to you that while categorizations are real in the realm, we usually are not accurate in how we try to measure them. Because our metrics are usually not the same as God's metrics. And I think it was uh, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, I think, that said that heaven will be heaven because it will be full of surprises. There are some of our big men that will probably qualify as the drivers of their drivers when we get to the better land. I tell you the truth, I lie not. The Bible says that God shall reward every man according to his labor. Not according to his result. It's according to his labor. It's according to his labor. One of, the, one of the things that has happened to us in our time is that the world has affected the church so much that our parameters for measurement now is being drawn from, from Babylon. And we've neglected the shekels of the sanctuary. There are certain things that are accepted out there that are not accepted in here. But a lot of times we use the same measure that they use out there. That's the same measure that we use in here. And it is one of the deliverances that God must give to you as a Christian so that you will be able to pursue destiny and strike it bull's eye. Because you know that God will not forget what God, where God made investment. And that God will not forget what investment is made for him. A big problem with so many of us in these matters is our scale of evaluation. Not just scale, our frame. I mean frame. Our frame. A lot of us have forgotten that we are part of not just a cosmic project. We are part of an eternal project. Hear me and hear me very well. We are not just part of a cosmic project. We are part of an eternal project. It is an eternal project. It is not just a project that is based on time. The project that you and I are part of is an eternal project. That means that when God is looking at you and God is looking at me, and in the context of our labors for God, God looks at everything that we do from the standpoint of eternity, and God processes it Processes it, it, processes it in eternity. What this means is not that God neglects time. I'm simply saying that the frame of God's reference is eternity. 
The haste that is in several of our spirits and in the spirit of several believers is because we are not just, we are time bound. And that is an error. God didn't make us so. He actually planted eternity in all of our hearts. But you see, in the course of the passage of our pilgrimage upon the face of the earth, there is something that time and life does to us. It narrows and constricts our perspective, even as Christians. So you start to see people struggling, even as believers, as if they will lose if they don't gain before they die. That is not Christian. That's not Christian. Our frame of reference is not time. Our frame of reference is eternity. When you see people struggling and scheming to ensure that, almost as if to make sure that they get return on investment. Like, you know, I've even heard people say things like, and it looks reasonable, right? Like, it's not when I die that you people now come and say, he blessed me, he did this. If I touched you, do it, show it while I'm alive. Now, I'm not saying there's any in people showing it while you are alive. I'm simply saying that you shouldn't act as if, if they don't show it, you will lose it. You will not lose it. Are you with me? You will not lose it. Ma'am, you will not lose it. If you invest labor and people don't recognize it and people don't appreciate it, it cannot be lost. We serve a God who keeps record. Are you with me? Uh, hello? Are you with me? Yes, sir. Your labor of love, say scriptures, cannot be in vain. People would labor and labor and labor and labor and they will die. And nobody will even know that they labored, let alone appreciate their labors. All right? Because there are several labors that don't involve being in the limelight. The issue is this, the God who rewards, God has eternity to balance the records. We want that record balanced in time. It's the same reason why people, people get exasperated. Even the psalmist got there in his consideration of, you know, world events in his own time. Like, I consider the prosperity of the wicked and the man was heartbroken. There are these terrible people unto whom it happens as it should happen to good people. And there are these good people unto whom it happens as you would expect that it will happen to bad people. The psalmist talked about the prosperity of the wicked. And he said, it was only when I went into your sanctuary that I saw their end. Because even in the United Kingdom, with all of the laws that you have and the precision with which uh, things seem to work. There are people that will defraud the state and they will never be caught in their lifetime. There's corruption everywhere. More prominent in some other places than others, right? I, I used to tell people at home, I said there are people who are milking Nigeria, blue, black. They will never be caught. What you people call karma is not of God, it's not Christian. Are you with me? I know Christians use that language a lot. They just don't know what it means. Karma is not a Christian concept. It's not biblical. Are you with me? It belongs in the pantheistic religion and it carries a huge freight of philosophical assumptions behind it. It's a system. The same way we have redemption as a system. Soteriology. When we studied, we studied salvation. Karma is something like that. It's not just, you know, it's, it's not like if you do bad things, bad things will come to you. If you do good things, good things will come to you. That's not karma. And I want you to know that bad things are not intelligent. There's a God who sits over the cycle of the earth. Any system that puts God out of the justice equation is not of God. But I digress. So, I tell them, karma will not catch up with several of these people. Huh? Some of them will live old. They will live long. They will die old. And they would have lived very well on our common patrimony as a nation. They will pass on that money and that the wealth that comes with it. They will pass it on to their children. Their children will pass it on to their children. 
and it can last like that for five generations. It's not all of them that their children will blow it up. Some people actually, the children will preserve it and they will enlarge it and it will become such a great dynasty in wealth. On this side of the divide, they will not be apprehended. They will not be caught. Nothing evil will happen to them that will be known to be, that will even be equivalent as a consequence of the corruption that they had involved in. The reason why God watches things like that happen is because God has eternity to, rec to set the record straight. Even if you don't believe God exists now, you know God is not under pressure. See, you must believe me. No, 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 no. A God that has eternity to clear your doubt cannot be under pressure in the 65 or 80 years that you will live. You see, am I like, believe me? No, 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 no. We are not afraid. We are not scared that you will not find out the truth. The reason we evangelize is that when you will find out the truth, the truth may not be useful to you positively anymore. Nobody is going to forever believe that God does not exist. All of us. The Bible says, unto you that hear prayer, all flesh shall come. If you don't come willingly, you will come inevitably. Everybody will stand before God one day. Including the people that did not believe God lives when they were alive. It's just that on that day, the knowledge of God will be dread. Therefore, knowing the terror of God will persuade men. It's not because we think men will not find out. No, they will. There's a way that seemed right unto a man, but the end thereof, the end at the ways of destruction. In the same way, in the same way, the man who labored and nobody saw his labor, God is not under pressure. I want you to know that even your reward, God is not under pressure. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. When I die, that is gain. The church of my day has reversed it. It is for to me to live is gain. When I die, we can embrace Christ. Or you see, while I'm alive, let's gain now. Paul's orientation was the exact opposite. He said, while I am alive, Christ. My lifetime is to maximize Jesus Christ. It's not because I'm a sadist. I've not taken an oath of poverty. There is gain in the equation. It's just a matter of context. I anticipate gain when I die. That's what Paul said. You know, I know you, you, you are looking for how to revolt against what I'm saying now. But it's not going to work because I have more where this came from. In, <laughs> there's more. Paul said, Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Do you know what that means? That means that the way we live our lives, if it is only in this world that we have hope as Christians, we are miserable people. The only reason why our Christian calling is not a miserable calling is because it's not only in this world that we have hope. That means that the, the true, authentic, kingdom-based gospel only makes sense in the light of eternity. If time was the only scale, misery will be inevitable. So when we've, we've come around with the, an ingenious, disingenuous gospel that makes people feel like, you know what, even if there's no life after death, Christianity is still the deal. That wasn't how Paul quite understood it. In Paul's understanding, it's because <laughs> there is life beyond life. That's why Christianity makes sense. Otherwise, we are miserable. It means that Christianity cannot, it cannot make sense outside of the scope of eternity. If time was all the frame that there was, Christianity would be a poor choice. You, you would be better off being something else than being a Christian if it is not that there's life beyond the grave. So that it is that dimension that makes life here now meaningful. Yes. 
That was why you saw Apostle Paul. You saw the way he went. People looked at him and it was like, this guy, are you, are you okay? You must be mad. And I'm going to read that. In more ways than one, they called him mad. The owner of this thing, if you go to Jerusalem, you are going to be captured. You'll be tortured. You'll be imprisoned. The man said, I'm not only willing to suffer in Jerusalem. I will die if need be. As if they didn't hear. They, they now started weeping. Ah, Paul now said, what meanest thou by this? Do you intend to break my heart? Are you trying to break my heart with your tears? Then he said, let's, let's resolve this matter. You just said that we suffer. I want you to know that I, went, I had gone beyond that. I have considered death and I've realized that even death is not a good deterrent. Now, you guys are just talking of suffering. Now, Agabus was not telling a lie. Paul went to Jerusalem true to his words, the words of the prophet. Paul was caught. Paul was imprisoned and they sent him to Rome. Are you with me? He went to Rome and we know that at least he spent the last two years of his life under house arrest in Rome. So, the prophet did not prophesy a lie. But this man had a different scale. And his scale was this. None of these things move me. If only that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry that I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of God's grace. And in the last letter that he wrote, he said, I have finished my course. If that guy was very, very, very apprehensive of, you know, challenges and wanted to preserve life at all costs, he would not have been able to say, I have finished. Because he said, my objective is to finish my course with joy. There's something, that means that there is a course content, there is a curriculum that is cut out for me and I want to conclude it. There were not too many people in scriptures that said that kind of thing. Jesus was one, notably. When Jesus said, it is finished, we, we rheumatize around it. And like your sickness is finished, your pain is finished, and it, it's okay. All right, by implication, they are finished too. But in context, Jesus was saying something. What did he come to finish? He said, my, we, my meat is to do the will of he that sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. And before he said it is finished, he was on the cross. And the Bible said, and Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. As he hung on the cross, he scanned, he scanned the corpus of prophecy and said, is there anything written concerning me in this side of my life that is still unfulfilled. And he remembered it was captured in the Psalms. That for my thirst, they gave me vinegar. Therefore, he said, I thirst. He didn't say I thirst particularly because he was thirsty. It was destiny. He wanted to fulfill. He wanted to finish his course. And the moment he received it. The Bible said, he bowed his head. He said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. By the time the Roman soldiers came, they realized the man has gone. Of course, what would he be waiting for? He has finished. He has finished. It, it, it was too fast. Now that he had gone, it now provided opportunity for the final bit to be fulfilled. He had yes, sir. Huh? Because the rot of man shall praise thee. And the remainder of wrath thou shalt restrain. God permitted them to kill Jesus, yet God didn't allow them to break his bone. I'm like, excuse me, sir, if somebody is already going to die, what's breaking a bone? No, my bone, none of his bone shall be broken. So, when the Roman soldiers came to hasten the death process, they would normally break the bone of the criminal. When they came there, they realized they had died. And they were like, no, that's too fast. How did he die now? Let's check. They put that spear by his side. 
and then the water and the blood came. They also didn't know what they were doing, right? Ah, but they were reenacting the birth of the church because that was where Eve was pulled out from, all right? In Adam, that same place. The, 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 the Roman soldiers, as they put the spear, the water and the blood, he came forth. And you will see the water and blood in John chapter 3. You will see it in First John chapter 1. All right? And they realized that he had died indeed. They knew a bit of medical science. As much as <laughs> we may think that they were ancient and archaic. They, understood. they had been doing that. They had perfected the art of crucifixion. So when they saw water and blood, then they did not proceed to break his bones. That it might be fulfilled that none of his bones shall be broken. So when Jesus said, it is finished, it was his course that he finished, his curriculum. The thing that was written of him in the volume of the book, he finished it. That was why when he stood in the temple, in the, in the synagogue, in Luke chapter 4, and they gave him the book to read of the prophet, he went to Isaiah chapter 61, remember? And he read from verse 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. All right? And he read and read. And he got to the middle of verse 2 to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. The very next sentence is, and the day of God's vengeance. He didn't read it. Because that is not for that coming. Yes, that's not for that coming. He was reading his manifesto for this coming. The, the other part is for the next coming. So when you, have said, when you have heard people that say, show me anywhere that Jesus killed somebody, they, have not, they didn't read the script. They didn't read very well. <laughs> the, the same Jesus, he was the one that said, currently I have come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That year will be followed by a day. It's called the day of the vengeance of our God. There will be fire in his eyes on that day. Second uh, Thessalonians tells us, chapter 1, verse 9, God will come in flaming fire. The Bible says it's a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction upon them that trouble you. The only difference is the timing. He said when he will come in flaming fire with his angels to take vengeance. That Jesus that you saw that never killed anybody, never hit anybody. Go and check the prophecies. It is captured that he will declare the day of the vengeance of the Lord. Now, when you check all through scripture, look at Joel, look at Amos, look at Acts of the Apostles, look at Thessalonians. You will see this thing called the day of the Lord. Sometimes they call it the great day of the Lord. Sometimes they call it the dreadful, the great and dreadful day. of. There is this day, a day when all eyes will gather blackness. There's a day. God needs one day. To catch up with all of the atrocity of human civilization in all of the dispensation and generations and civilization in a day, God will bring our civilization on its knees. But you see, as gracious as God is, God has a year to accept people. He reserves just a day to settle this cause. And you and I must live with eternity in view. That's that, that way to labor as a believer. With eternity in view. I want you to know that God will not owe you nothing. Yes, God will not owe you anything. He will not owe you. I don't even want to go into the, the, the paradox of reward. The fact that God rewards us is a paradox. How can you ever deserve a reward? When God saved you, you know it was a free gift, right? Uh -huh. the, because the entire life that you will live will not be enough to say thank you for salvation. At what point do you start to actually get points <laughs> for reward? So in the first place, it's a paradox that there's actually reward in the picture. 
But for people to want to put God under pressure, like, if you don't give it to me now, if you don't give it to me now, no, no. God is almighty. You, you can't, you can't um, twist God. And sometimes those that have tried, you remember that it didn't end well. Don't go into all of that. Huh? God can give you the desire of your heart and send leanness into your soul. Are you with me? He gave them the desires of their heart, but he sent leanness into their soul. The meat they were looking for, the, as the meat was in their mouth and their carcasses were dropping. They started out with manna. Manna was such a beautiful thing. The first day manna fell, it was a miracle. Hey, we have a very big God, though. He's always, you know, God of Prophet, El Shaddai, they sang all the songs. After a short while, that miracle, they commonized it to the point by virtue of monotony, they commonized it to the point that they began to murmur against their miracle. They said, Moses, please go and check. Where this thing is coming from? Is this the only thing there? Because variety is a spice of life. Hmm? Is, there, is, there, is this all that exists where this is coming from? At this point, I decided longing for the onions and cucumber that they ate in Egypt. They were like, would to God that you had left us in Egypt to die. They were looking for meat. 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 Eh? So, so, we need meat. Meat. Give, at least let our, our teeth crack something. Eventually, God gave them their request. They had meat, but they didn't have life. So, just in case you think you can um, twist God, it never ends well. Never ends well. When God, when God takes you to process, that was how I was going. When God takes you to process, you need to understand, otherwise you will start to begrudge him. And a Christian must never begrudge God. Blessed is he whosoever that is not offended in me. A Christian cannot begrudge God. I was going to say that the reason we can trust God in the dark is because we are not in the dark about God. I can trust him in the dark because I'm not in the dark about him. I trust God enough to trust him with darkness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. It's not because I know so much. It's for thou art with me. I want you to know that the greatest, the greatest resource that God, to, God can give to a person is presence. 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 So that when there are no answers, you will still know the answer. Because the answer is the person, it's presence. Where we come from, we used to have power outage. And when you have a child, and it's bedtime, and they are just, you know, still playing around in the room, and suddenly the light goes off, and they're alone, they start to cry. Sometimes babies, children like that. The child will start to cry. And sometimes, when you just hear that cry, you know what it is. And your reflex is to run to the place. So you actually, I would run into the room without any source of light, right? And then, you step in and you call the child's name. And then the child suddenly stops crying. It's still dark. Presence. It's dark, but daddy is here. It changes everything. Presence. Sometimes that presence is more reassuring than the propositional answers you are looking for. If you know why what has not happened has not happened, how does that change your life? You know, sometimes, you know, you know sometimes there's no answer God gives you that does not generate a question. Oh, have, you, have you thought about it? Like, okay, not now. All right, at least God has said not now. Then the next thing is, when? 
Hmm? God now says, okay, two years time. All right? You know, I say, why do I need to wait that long? There is no possible answer God gives you, for instance, if you want, that cannot generate a question. So you need to come to terms with God as the answer. Yes. God is the answer. So when we say Jesus is the answer, all right, we are not just saying Jesus knows the answer. We are saying he is, he is, he is the answer. That when I have Jesus, that is the answer. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He didn't just say I know. I am. So that you need to know Jesus beyond words. You need to know Jesus beyond the pragmatic. All right? Jesus is not a mechanic. He's not, he, he's not a handyman. You need to know him beyond that. Does he fix things in our lives? Yes! But we must never lose sight of the one who does the fixing. He is. The same way that my child will stop crying when I step into a dark room that he is in. Even though light has not yet come. I didn't come with light, but I came. His, 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 his response to the darkness changes when I step into it with him. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Changes everything. And that process, that process changes you to become the kind of person that will be able to handle the destination. That destination is what attracts kings in the end. I was trying to begin to detail to you the brightness of your rising. That there is a process by which intensity is gained. Value in the spirit. There is a process by which God brings value in the spirit into the lives of his people. Eventually, you would realize that that is the thing that becomes the basis of your standing on that big day. So you look at a man like David, went through so much. Through so much. Through so much. But you see, till today, that city is called the city of David today. When you get into the New Testament, the New Testament talking about the genealogy of Jesus says the book of the generation of Jesus, the son of David, the son of, the son of Abraham. I think that's Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. The book of the generation of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. How do you go from Jesus to David? You know how many human beings are between Jesus and David? Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Because that's the genealogy of that covenant. And those were the arrowheads. Yet, when you look at the lives of those people, they, 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 they light, we talk of the star of David, the city of David, that light, the process by which God brought that dimension of intensity to come out of it, Many times people would have thought God was being wicked to the man. But as the wise man said, God writes straight with crooked lines. He writes straight with crooked lines. Because the process will begin from tonight. I just want to draw your heart to a place of prayer. It's preparatory for the things that will start to happen. One who asks the Lord that the Lord will reconfigure our hearts. Huh? That eternity will become our scope. It, otherwise, you will be agitated unnecessarily. You will be agitated unnecessarily. You will now need to realize that no labor will go unrecognized. No labor will go unrewarded. Are you with me? No labor will go unrecognized. It won't go unrewarded. Even 
your process, the process that God brings you through, is making something out of your life that will earn points for you in the world of the immortals. I may not understand the particularities of your journey and of your story and everything that God has brought you through and all of the, uh, uh, the accountability that you have had to maintain before God in your private place. But a day is going to come when you will shine as the star of the firmament. And on that day, it will become obvious that even though some people were conspicuous and prominent, prominence is not always the same as importance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The most prominent part of several of our, bodies, of our bodies generally are not the most important. And that's why you, you, you have to be a different kind of believer from this weekend. Huh? You know, sometimes people want to marry somebody. You take that decision, usually on the basis of the things you can see. Like, you know, I like the guy. He's fair. He's tall. He's handsome. I, I, like, the sh I, I like people with pointed nose. Right? Yes, I like people with pointed nose. I, I, you know, he has, he's got this wavy hair or something. Some, and we see all of these things. You know that the most important members of your body are members of your body that you are not meant to see ever. Ever. That guy that has a pointed nose that you love him so much, his kidney may have been wasted already. His heart may be hanging by a thread. But you can't yet see it. You're just looking at the prominent features of a person, many times, are even features you can live without. Right? Yes. You may like curly hair. Eventually, you can lose the hair. Life goes on. You're there was, there was a point where my hairline, my hairline used to struggle with my eyelash when I was much younger. I tell you the truth, I lie not. My, hair, my hairline used to, was almost hitting my eyelash. So when I hear, when I, when I hear people are saying, yeah, I'm immortal, I'm immortal, I'm immortal, I'm entered into immortality. I say, can't you see your hairline? Even your hairline tells you that you are not yet immortal. It, the thing is receding, it's proof. <laughs> that immortality is in view, is not here yet. You can have the hair, you can lose the hair. You, you can lose this your nose tree. You can lose your pinna. You can lose both arms. Are you with me? You can lose your legs. There are things that you cannot lose and still be you. And many of them are things you will never see. There are some of the most important members of the body of Christ and members of the body of Christ that you and I will never know. You see the hands, you see the legs, you see the face, you see the nose. All right? You don't see the brain. You don't see the heart. You don't see the kidney. You don't see the lungs. You don't see the spleen. There are so many of these vital organs. They are called vital organs. Many of them you never see. The day you have a chance to see your brain, you will not see your brain. <laughs> because in the course of seeing your brain, you will no longer see the brain because there will be no you to see the brain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't see your kidney. General, normally speaking, you can't see your heart. Normally speaking. When people are trying to choose a life partner, you know, most times they don't used to do comprehensive tests. They say, Let's see uh, what's the state of your kidney, what's the state of your heart. They, many times people take this decision on the basis of very peripheral things. Then you get into it and realize that the guy has only six months to live. As beautiful as he is, as handsome as she is, <laughs> you know, they are beautiful guys and handsome ladies. Hallelujah. 
that our scale will not be like the scale of the world. So that if God were to say to you, this is what I want you to do for me until I come, you will not begrudge him. And say, how will they ever know me? If God says, I want you to be the kidney, detoxify in this house for me. That's the engine that you are in the spirit. You will never be conspicuous. But it might be more important than the conspicuous. You can have an amputated arm and still lead a normal life. Really. That there are people that we cannot do without, but we are not aware of. So do not let the bling bling become the metrics by which you measure things. Not because there is not a metric, but because it is not a bling bling. This is why, finally, before I get out of here, this is why God said, yes, the setting of the church. All right? This is, this is why God said to us, do not avenge ourselves. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. The, the general principle is this. You do not know the extent, the real extent of people's culpability. Leave the punishing to me. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Not might, not may. I will repay. I will. Vengeance is mine. Not yours. Mine. So there is vengeance in the equation. There is repayment in the equation. But God says, leave that to me. The reason is because you don't know the exact degree of people's culpability. So you will be wrong if you wanted to judge people to determine how much vengeance, how much punishment they deserve. Your metric is not accurate. So leave that to me. Take care of the loving. You can't go wrong loving. You can go wrong trying to judge. You can go wrong trying to punish. So leave vengeance to me. Leave repayment to me. I will do that. You can love them. It's almost like say, feed them, I kill them. Right? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. God is saying, you feed him, I kill him. Because sometimes, your enemies are not your enemies. The people you think are your enemies are not your enemies. If God's vengeance were to come down, the people your vengeance would have come on are not the people God's vengeance will come on. God doesn't want you to be guilty like that. So he said, leave it to me. You, you don't really know these things behind the scenes, either positively or negatively. So we only do our best. Don't let them for people's judgment. Don't let it become the true measure in your mind of your true essence because they don't have the metric everybody just trying the people God said for us to honor we honor them because it's commanded in the final analysis God knows the true value of every man's work are you with me so when these men arose in the church and Herod said I'm going to go after certain among them he didn't go after just any kind of person he took James. He next came after Peter. These were somewhat, according to Paul's language, the pillars of the church. So when Satan is coming after somebody like that, sometimes we are tempted to think it's because you are weak in faith. And there are people who think like it's because they are so strong in faith, that's why they have far less attacks than we do. The point is, they are not important enough for Satan to bother with them. It's not because they are too strong. It, they just don't matter that much. Herod is not after everybody. He's not after everybody. So the fact that he's not after you, is not a badge of honor. Really, it isn't. You just don't show up in the radar. 
there are there are people there are people that there are people that they will send if satan is distributing this thing there are people he sends apprentice people that are still learning how to tempt apprentice demons you send them after the weaklings among us then there are those that sit and say no leave that one for me you know leave leave this one for me say leave that one for me huh leave that one for me so you now saw a man a boy david and Saul was being harassed by demons. They said, can we find the person that is skillful in playing? That can come and play. You see, if you are going to send a demon to harass the king of Israel, you will not send the last, the last recruit. You, you will send a veteran. The demon that will harass a king that has the anointing of God upon his head. Cannot be an apprentice. But there is a David. Whose instrument of music, without the supply of electrical energy, no amplification, the man did not even have the name of Jesus. That his crude instrument of music was able to check out demons, the level of demons that harasses a king. His, his instrument drove those demons out as long as he's in that space he quarantined the space huh? there is a brightness that brings you in contact with kings it's not every minstrel that we do on such a day it's not every minstrel David was not the only minstrel in the land they said we found the son of Jesse huh? they said he is a cunning player and the Lord is with him those were his credentials he had skill the man had developed skill skill in the playing of the lie skill in the playing of the of the harp but on top of his skill was something that was not native to the earth something that was foreign to the earth the lord they said and the lord is with him there's a brightness to your rising and that brightness is what will catch the attention of kings light might suffice for gentiles but intensity is required for kings and in order for you to get to that point there will be a process in the course of that process, you will change. You will die. Many deaths. Die. Many deaths. By the time you come out on the other end, you will be a masterpiece in God's hand that God can place you anywhere in the world. And he will know that this has our interest. He has our oil. He is our brand ambassador. That process and this education begins from tonight you know the face of this meeting changed this evening there's a boot camp now where all of the things that have been said god is going to start to walk them into your being into your essence we are now stepping to the threshing floor we are now stepping into the nursery we are we are stepping now into the formatory the place where god teaches the hands of men to war and their fingers to battle. The place where God makes the feet of men like hinds feet. And he gives them the tongue of the learned. There's a place. In the secret of his pavilion. Where God makes men. Like a sharp threshing instrument. That has teeth. You will speak. And men cannot ignore you. People will either. They will grind their teeth. Either in regret. Or in conviction. Nobody will ever say, okay, that, it depends on how you see. If that works for you, that's fine. No. You, you, there is a place where God makes those kinds of weapons. That when they show forth, you can't listen to them and be indifferent. Kings will come to that brightness of your emergence. Let us pray. Let us pray. I'm out of time. We are about to step into the trenches of the spirit. 
where God digs, where God frames, where God forms, where God transforms. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. Can you can you can you just surrender tonight? I know that this may be quite overwhelming. And you may not even know exactly what to say to God in prayer. But probably you just want to say God, however you want it, just do it. I, I, I'm, av I'm available. I, I, I'm available. I'm available. Admit me, Jesus. Admit me. Admit me. Admit me. Don't leave me to myself. Admit me. There is a place that the eye of the eagle has not seen. There's a place. Admit me. There's a secret pavilion where David's are crafted. I want to be among the certain of the church. The certain. The men and women that the enemy, the evil one cannot ignore. I may have no name in my city. I may have no name among my peers. But in the realm of the spirit, where it matters most, may I matter where it matters. 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 Take me, Jesus. Bring me through. Bring me through your academy. There's a school of the spirit. There is a place. There is a place where you train hands. There is a place where you teach fingers. There is a place. There is a place where you strengthen knees. There is a place where you sharpen mouth and tongue. There is a place. The secret place. That's where I want to be. Take me to the place The place you are A secret place That's where I want to be take, take me to the place The place you are the secret place that's where I want to be that's where I want to be take me take me to the place the place you are the secret place that's where I want to be two more times take me to the place take me to the place the place you are the secret place that's where I want to be oh take me to The place you are, the secret place, that's where I want to be, that's where, that's where I want to be. Take me to the place. Take me.
me to the place. From the prying eyes of curious men and women, take me to the place where it is my Lord and I. Take me to the place. Let me know the secret of the Lord. The place from which David came. And he said, the Lord is my rock. He is my salvation. He has become my light. The Lord is my shepherd. He learned these precious spiritual lessons in the crucible of the dealings of the Lord. Shut away from the gaze of his older brothers of his father, of his society. God was crafting a weapon, mighty weapon, in the backsides of the civilization of his day. There is a place. There's a place. There's a place. There's a place. Tonight, you want to say in the next 15 seconds, bring me to that place, Jesus. Bring me to that place, Jesus. Bring me to that place, Jesus. I want to be among the men and women by whose life you will teach principalities and powers, the manifold wisdom of God. There is a place. There is a place. In 10 seconds, bring me to the place. Take me to the place. Admit me into the place, the school of the spirit, where weapons are forged, where brightness is imparted, where weapons are polished, that they might be able to reflect the light of the sun of righteousness, a polished weapon. Bring me to your workshop. Lay your grip upon me. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Lay your grip upon me. I don't want to escape. I don't want to be slippery. Let your grip be firm upon my destiny. Turn this life around into a veritable weapon in your hand. Let the brightness of my rising let it become a reality in the days ahead. I will rise, I will rise brightly. Polish, sharpen, purge, purify. Take me, Jesus. Do to me what you do to your prized vessels. Take me to the place where it is God without disguise. Take me. Take me. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice tonight, Jesus. That none of us will miss out of the things of the Spirit of God for each of our lives every education that is necessary every equipping every training every texturing every transformation lord let it come let everyone here be admitted privately personally into the academy of your spirit your work begin your work complete take us as we are Make us into the men of your ordination. Make us into the people of your own choosing. That by our lives we put on display the manifold wisdom of God. That kings will come to the brightness of our rising. That Gentiles will come to our light. It shall be said, let us go to Judah. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Men will come to seek of the way of Yahweh. And they will not be disappointed. Lord, let no man, let no woman be left to himself or to herself.
let no one escape the grip the grip of destiny let the education begin let the training begin let the dealings begin for thine is a kingdom for thine is a power for thine is a glory in Jesus mighty name